Welcome to Solutions for Higher Education, a podcast by Scott L. Wyatt, President of Southern Utah University in Cedar City, Utah. To subscribe to this podcast, please visit www.suu.edu forward slash President's Podcast, where you will find both the audio and a written transcript for today's podcast. You're listening to part two of an episode featuring the best moments from the first 50 podcasts. So Cedar City is known for lots of things. You know, we've been a, uh, a jumping off point to the national parks. Certainly we remain that. Um, it, we're surrounded by all sorts of natural beauty. But one of the things that we are also best known for is our annual Shakespeare Festival, a uh, Tony Award winning festival. Yeah, Utah's only Tony Award winning theater. That's right. And here it is in little old Cedar City. That's right. It's a, it's a part of Southern Utah University that we're very proud of. We had a, a podcast interview with the director of education for uh, the Shakespeare Festival, and in particular their last year's theme, which was Shakespeare and the Other, and it was talking about tolerance and inclusion uh, and and seeing that through Shakespeare's plays. And, and in a particular uh, give and take back and forth with Michael Barr, who is was our guest on the podcast that day, you and he were discussing why Shakespeare's plays are still relevant now uh, for 100 plus years later. So this is, this is our interview with Michael Barr from Podcast 28 from Season 2. Hamlet, uh, when he's trying to catch the conscience of the king, when he's trying to uh, see whether or not his uncle is guilty or not, uh, he says, you know, the play's the thing wherein we'll catch the conscience of the king. But he also talks about holding the mirror up to nature so that we can actually see ourselves. And that, for me, is what, uh, I mean, that's the definition of theater. Um, we're seeing ourselves up on stage and seeing us created there. So how wonderful that we get to have this conversation, not only about the Utah Shakespeare Festival, but uh, about... About how, some of the themes for the year. Yeah, yeah. So this is this is an interesting way to look at it, that that a play holds a mirror up to us. Mm -hmm. If it didn't, it wouldn't seem as relevant. Correct. And if it didn't, it wouldn't last hundreds of years. We're looking at plays that are 400 years old and are still relevant today. And that's why uh, we weep. It's why we laugh. Um, and we could just jump right into the plays that we're doing this. It, I mean, this season in particular... Uh, was intentionally designed to talk about tolerance, to talk about um, uh, civility, uh, how we relate to one another. I like to use the term, and we just had a scholars conference where this was the theme, um, and we called it Shakespeare and the Other. How do we, how do we look at those that are different, or when we are? excluded within a group and every mm -hmm. single play including our non-shakespeare plays had to do with that same type that of same thing. topic yeah and when we talk about tolerance it's more than just tolerating <laughs> oh, yeah but it's I, a, we, we, we use the word tolerance because it's so much a part of our language but i'm not sure if i do you like the word tolerance because it's well, it, I, it's like rather than realizing that <laughs> let me use a play so you've got I, Merry Wives of Windsor, right? If you tolerate someone, they're just kind of sitting there as opposed to yeah. including. Including. And you becoming bigger and better because of this this person being in the room with you. Yeah, and I've, this is not, these are not my words. And, and they're not the right words, but they're close. Mm -hmm. I'm paraphrasing, of right? course. Tolerance is like inviting somebody to the party. right. And inclusion is asking them to dance. That, that's right. <laughs> Having seen some of those plays, um, going back and listening now to that podcast, it, it reminds me of how impactful um, theater and other other artistic events can be to, as, as we suggested here, holding a mirror up to ourselves and to society. 
Yeah, it's uh, this is a this is and this particular season what they kind of focused on inclusion and diversity and tolerance and valuing others and um, and Shakespeare provides some great examples of when that didn't work so well. That's right. And and a great motivation as to why we should be good with each other. The arts have a particular way of communicating to us values that we should um, spend a lot of time talking about. Well, you know I'm in favor of that. I, <laughs> <laughs> that's been where I've worked for a long, long time. So anyway, that, 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 was, that was actually a, a real favor of mine, that, that Shakespeare one. So, President, you and I, um, I think, would be in agreement that the greatest blessing that we have in our job is that we daily get to work with young people. Um, working and and being around students helps keep us young. It helps um, hopefully guide and direct them in some of the choices that they're making during a really critical juncture in their lives. And playing a part of that is uh, maybe the most rewarding work that you could be involved in. And hopefully everybody, regardless of what job a person has, hopefully everybody feels like their job is very meaningful. We certainly feel our jobs are meaningful. We we get to work in an industry where the goal is to help people advance and become better and it's upward mobility and uh, giving people that didn't have an opportunity an opportunity and building communities and families and the economy, everything. That's right. It's, it's the it's the greatest industry in the world. I I agree. So from earlier than this season, in season two, we had two students that joined us, Shanna Bartell and Newman Conte, to talk about the importance of student scholarships in being able to allow students to attend a university and to engage in some of the activities that you say, to strengthen their themselves and their communities um, and provide opportunity and accessibility for those that, that might not otherwise have it. I th- I think I maybe have never heard though a more compelling story about <laughs> starting from nothing um, than Newman Conte's story. Uh, he's a young man from Mali in Africa and left home at the age of four, if you can imagine, to uh, go find a place to study because there was no school in his village. And the and the story of of how he got started on that, watching his father have to trade a chicken um, to someone who would read for him because his his father couldn't read. Um, It's just a a very compelling story and and highlights the importance of scholarships and financial aid um, in helping our students to achieve their goals. And I was lucky enough to have Newman in an honor seminar last semester. So think of a, think of Newman um, from Mali, in Western Africa. And our seminar class was on the re- speeches and writings of Abraham Lincoln. So everybody in the class knows who Abraham Lincoln is, and and he's actually a new idea for Newman. And when Newman goes back to Mali, and changes the world in his community or in his nation because he's going to be a leader in that country. Um, he's going to take with him some of these great principles from some of these great, great leaders and thinkers that we've always known. So this is from Season 2, Episode 40. This is Student Scholarships and the Story of Newman Conte. I, when, I was the first, when I was four years old, I left my family and go a different part of Mali. Uh, I always wanted to go to school and uh, learn different things and try different things. And uh, where my parents were, there was no school. I never see a person have a book or writing or something. But when I saw my dad uh, paying somebody uh, to, he sell the chicken. When I first saw him, um, you know, he told me to grab a chicken and he sell that chicken to uh, pay somebody to write his letter and read it. And uh, 
moment I thought uh, my dad is ineducated. Uh, he didn't go to school. Uh, but now, as a son, what I can do about that. So this, how old were you when this happened? I was four years old. Four years old. Yes. Your dad's got a letter. He needs to read it, but he can't read. He can read. And nobody will read it to him unless he pays them. Yes. So he turns over a chicken, which is a pretty valuable thing. Yes. In order to get somebody to read for him. You're watching this and saying, I'm not going to be paying chickens for people to read to me. For read to me, yes. So you left home and stayed. Uh, where, who did you stay with? I didn't stay with anybody as I left home. I was uh, around, you know, uh, just lay down around next to the building or I was staying in the school. Since, you were homeless? Yes, I was homeless at that time. But you were going to school? I was going to school. How Every, far away was this from your home? It was a 50 kilometers. 50 kilometers from your village? From my village. So I didn't get to see my parents that much. And uh, I didn't have a phone or write them a letter because nobody could read that. And uh, I was just completely disconnected uh, with my family. That's a pretty heavy price to pay to go to school as a kid. Yeah. So then after you're in school for a while, then how did you get connected with um, Wasatch Academy, which is a high school in Mount Pleasant, Utah? Yeah. So... While I was going to school in Willisibugu, I saw, I uh, loved to walk around, and uh, I saw uh, a guy who was a mayor and got his uh, master's degree in uh, a BYU, uh, it was from uh, Willisibugu, and uh, he was driving a car, and uh, he drove to his house, and I saw him, you know, stop out of the car and open the gate, and then drive a car again, and then it was wind blowing, and then, you know, as soon as he, there's nobody to hold the, the gate for him. So I saw that, and I ran into him, and I put the uh, rocks into the gate so he could drive on his driveway at the house. And then uh, he stopped at the car and asked me, hey, young man, where are you from? You know, who are you? And uh, what did you, why did you help me? And I said, uh, I told him where, you know, I'm from and, uh, you know, what I'm doing here. And he asked me where I live. I said, uh, I don't have a home and uh, I'm going to school. And he invited me to his house. And uh, I was, I lived with him about two years. And, uh, you know, I'm, I speak French. And uh, when his friends would come from France and in America, uh, just do humanitarian uh, project in Mali, and I'll be the interpreter. And uh, now I have a house, you know, I have a place to stay. And I eat pretty well, and then I, I'm going to school, but at the same time I have a little job and uh, just be an interpreter for those visitors. And uh, I met a guy who really was just so touched by... Um, he was impressed the way I greet people, the way I carry myself, you know, do the all the little things to them. And uh, he just decided, he asked me what is my goals. And so I said, I just want to go to school. I want to keep learning. And he said, uh, would you like to come to America? And I said, what is America? And <laughs> <laughs> what and, is America? Yeah. And he said, that's where I am from. And then uh, um, he was able to reach out to Wasatch, and they give me a full ride scholarship to come study uh, there. So that's how I got to Wasatch and uh, Utah. I think my favorite part of that episode is when a young Newman said to the man that uh, he was helping hold the gate open, what is America? <laughs> you're, you're from America. <laughs> what is America? And uh, um, in that very innocent question, um, I think it, the opportunity for him was greatly, greatly expanded. Yeah. The promise of America is bigger than America. That's right. It's a lot bigger than America. And sometimes we lose track of what our promise is, but 
but this opportunity that people can advance and make their lives and the worlds around them better. It's great. And it would be so much fun. In fact, it's too bad we don't have the time because we could do a podcast where every day we spoke to somebody like Newman. Yeah. The there stories are hundreds are, and hundreds of compelling stories. Yeah, yeah. The, the people that live and work around um, Southern Utah University and other universities in this country scarcely know the sacrifice, the stories, the the defeats and the triumphs that occur in the souls and minds of students who are trying to um, and are succeeding yeah. yeah, in moving through their lives. Their stories are unbelievably compelling. So, President, we don't talk about this all this much, but uh, we actually have a great group of people that we work with that help us get this podcast on the air. Um, and uh, uh, while I handle the recording side of things, I, uh, I have some student helpers and other helpers that transcribe and edit, and uh, uh, they put it up on the website and make sure it gets on iTunes, and, and we have people from marketing that help us with it. So we, we polled our helpers to see if we could get um, some feedback on what their favorite episodes were. And so Jill Whitaker, <clears throat> who is uh, in IT and helps us get this podcast on the air every week, make sure that all the links work and that we that we have any supporting material that we need to. Um, she just does a terrific job. Her favorite episode was the episode um, where we had Dan Andreg on as a guest uh, about higher education versus YouTube what is what is the value added if if I can if I can learn everything I need to in a tutorial on on YouTube why am I paying you to um, you know to give this to me so we um, this was this was an episode in which Dan who helped me develop the master of music degree uh, in music technology here uh, th- this was where we talked with him about the idea of of resources outside of the university that are available to help students. And I think it's not, it's not too much of a stretch to say that for hundreds of years, the university was the repository of knowledge. And the Internet has done a great job of democratizing, for better or for worse, for accurate or inaccurate, um, the... Uh, the information that is available in the world. And so it, it's probably a legitimate question, a legitimate concern. Why, why, would I, why would I need you if I can learn everything I need to know about whatever it is, fill in the blank, by simply downloading an app or watching YouTube? And what is our value added? Yeah, and the question has a lot of different answers and takes a while to explore all those, doesn't it? It but, does. But part of it is, of course, that uh, what we're doing is not just getting particular knowledge. We're becoming particular kinds of people. That's part of it, isn't it? It is. That that sort of interaction and um, and and even more specifically, um, in my area, the idea that that in a tutorial you can learn lots of specifics about how to operate a piece of software but unless you're working on the exact same project that that person in the video is watching it's significantly less meaningful to you um and and furthermore you can't talk back to the computer screen and get response i mean you can but it's probably not going to respond so so it, what, one of the things that, that we have suggested in our master's degree, um, and I, I think is fairly common, is that, that teachers don't ignore what is available on the Internet. Um, we help curate those lists and say, Here's, let me guide you towards some really accurate or really hard-hitting or really useful information. Then watch that, engage with it, then come back with your questions. And... And that's where, that's where that loop gets um, uh, made. We we are able to 
say, here's what this person said. It's true for this particular context. Here are some other contexts. Here are some things that you maybe hadn't thought of. Um, and, uh, and you can't ask the person on the YouTube video these questions. So, so integrating technology into the classroom um, is an ongoing, I think, uh, uh, joy and hassle um, for for <laughs> faculty members both, um, because right. because that democratization has been amazing. It 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 the the just the pure amount of information that's available is staggering. It's overwhelming, and um, so it's it's up to to professors to try to help guide students through that maze a little bit. So anyway, this is our interview with Dan Andereg from season two, episode thirty two. Higher Education versus YouTube. So you and I went through this process of creating a new master's degree in music technology, and that's not the point of this podcast, although I will say, uh, check us out at uh, suu.edu slash music technology. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, but I, uh, seriously, search SUU music technology and find our master's degree. But one of the things that you and I did from the very beginning was we had the conversation of what do we want the curriculum to look like? And what are the hard questions that people are going to ask us? And one of the questions that, that we came up with right off the bat that ironically no one ever did ask us uh, as we were getting the degree approved and so forth was this. If a student were to present themselves to us and say, why should I pay you graduate tuition for three semesters when I could learn everything that you're going to teach me on YouTube in a series of tutorials. We, we felt like we needed to have a ready answer for that. And I, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on the show today was because of your background with me in that, but also of your background with Pluralsight, and, uh, which is a, a for-pay uh, commercial training organization. And at, at, how do we... How do we answer those questions in a world where people feel like they are one WebMD visit away from being a doctor or one YouTube tutorial uh, away from being Frank Lloyd Wright or whoever? Uh, how, how do we, how do, what, what extra value does higher education add that you cannot get through a YouTube tutorial? So I will I will try and let you speak. I have so many thoughts, <laughs> but I honestly, um, when I was when I was contemplating this and uh, contemplating my masters, um, I realized that yes, I was in a classroom. It was very practical, project based. We were writing music every single week, and and somewhat in a, a group peer reviewing our, our ourselves and our peers. But I realized I thought, okay, what about texts? What texts did we use? And I, I, our texts were videos. They were YouTube videos in in the classroom, and other videos that were curated by a knowledgeable, experienced professor. Um, and that's part of why I thought maybe maybe my master's was really unique. Is that um, I will admit that there is a wealth of knowledge, whether it's YouTube or a, a paid for service like Pluralsight or anywhere else. There's so many places online you can find this information. Whether it is um, you know, paid for or not, there is a wealth of knowledge and I could learn information. It's just at my fingertips about anything. I mean, I, I could learn quantum mechanics. Someone has put the information online. Um, but curating it, because there is so much of it, the quality of that needs to be curated by somebody who actually understands the subject. And then beyond that, there's a mentorship element to it that, that teaches you application. So, you know, I can read, if I want to learn photography, I can read and read and read and read all about lighting and how to use lighting and then go experience, experiment with it. But who's going to tell me who's right or wrong in an environment that I'm going to learn it in a safe way, unless I go out there and get a bunch of gigs and take, you know, people's money and take their pictures and get the lighting really wrong and have a whole bunch of really mad customers. I'm going to learn from that, but it's a lot, 
a lot of painful painful uh time and you probably are out of business before you get the lesson all the way learned right you know word of mouth i i there's no way i'm going to get more clients in that city right so i i really feel like the benefit there is curating the right content um finding the content that teaches the right thing without misinformation um there are a lot of people that put stuff online that have learned it themselves or learned it from another youtube tutorial and they may just not know a couple of pitfalls because they haven't run into them yet but a trusted mentor um, who's curated it and guides you through the process of implementing it into your own art or or maybe you're not doing art is invaluable absolutely invaluable and that that is prolonged after you receive your actual degree piece of paper and walk away from school um I'm still in touch with professors who who I worked with in higher ed. And like I said, our texts were watching clips of videos on YouTube and discussing them and critiquing them and rescoring them. And um, I think that's really the value and the difference between just hearing and knowing the information and really, truly implementing that into what I do. I try not to make too many shameless plugs for our master's degree program, despite the fact that I didn't do a very good job there of hiding my, (laughs) my hucksterism. (laughs) Anyway, we want to thank, uh, we want to thank Dan and we want to thank Jill. Well, you're a, you're a proud Papa. I I am. I, (laughs) we, we, I think we do a good job of helping students. Another, another one of our, uh, um, co-workers that helps us get this on the air is Lexi Carter. She works in our PR office and uh, she loved one of our episodes from season one, episode number 16, The Value of a Liberal Arts Education. And this was actually a two-parter. So this comes from part two when we were interviewing our provost, Brad Cook, soon to be leaving us to head to Snow College to be the president. But our uh, our academic vice president and provost, Brad Cook, and we were talking about the the value, um, uh, again, return on investment type of value of a liberal uh, arts education. Liberal arts education is not always well understood, and it's partly because we don't understand the word liberal and we don't understand the word art. <laughs> um, if we could just get those two words understood, but this idea that we're broadening our understanding of the world around us and a uh, very important part of very important part of um, our lives well that's right and and a very important part of getting a job and making your way in the world <laughs> you know right. is is communication and all a lot of the things teamwork you know the the types of skills that we learn in liberal arts, despite the fact that that they are often seen not as career education, in fact, very much are uh, career education. We we um, we talk about this all the time. The four things that we understand employers are looking for more than anything else uh, include oral communication, written communication skills, problem solving, and critical thinking. I remember sitting out at a, a mine, and we, we talked about this, yeah. sitting out at a mine where my assumption was that the employer of this mine wanted people that could come out there and do a bunch of technical tasks, like welding and running a truck or operating a computer system. And when I said, what can we do to help you? What can we do to help students be prepared to come and work for you? The answer was, send me people prepared to be managers. Hmm. It wasn't... That's surprising. Train better in welding or this or that. It was um, every person that I hire at this mine, whether it's for a custodial position or driving a truck or operating the computer... all of these different jobs, he said, I am always hiring somebody that in the back of my mind, I'm hoping will become a leader. And, um, and you can help them with that That's by right. teaching them critical thinking skills, problem solving skills, how to communicate. Yeah. Um, you, you have a manual that you, 
that the technicians will use in fixing equipment. It's really complicated. Help them figure out how to read hard stuff. This is this is our uh, our episode interviewing Brad Cook and Lexi Carter's favorite, the value of a liberal arts education. President, you've, you're I've heard you speak about this, and I really like your thoughts on this um, as a philosopher, but as a professional educator. When when asked the question, what is the purpose of a higher education? Right? And there are lots of answers to this, but but there's a you know it's not only just about you know, career and, and, and workforce development. It's not only about sort of personal enrichment, but there's something bigger at stake too as it relates to citizenry. What, what are your thoughts about the, the role that higher education plays in, in a healthy democracy? Yeah, so if, you, if we go back to 1776 and sit in that world those who founded this country were creating something that really had never happened before. It was the first time that a group of people had sat down and through careful deliberation created um, a form of democracy. And that was dependent upon the people being educated enough, engaged enough, thoughtful about other people enough that that the, the people themselves could kind of be in charge. Never been successful before. And one of the fun pieces of this comes from the Massachusetts Constitution that John Adams wrote, where he said that it shall be the duty of legislators in all future periods of this commonwealth to cherish the interests of literature and the sciences. And he goes on to talk about natural history to countenance and inculcate the principles of humanity, general benevolence. We're going to teach general benevolence. <laughs> Public and private charity, industry, frugality, honesty, right there. One of our responsibilities, according to John Adams, is to teach honesty. Um, good humor, social affections, generous sentiments among the people. It's a, it's a wonderful writing and a great description of what the founders of this country thought was so important for the people who would end up being those who govern. And uh, I, I, I think that our job is as important to help people be financially independent, or I should say it's no more important to do that than it is for them to help maintain this great country in the, the governance of it. How do, you, how do you know whether you're reading a newspaper, whether you're reading something you can believe or not? How do you, how do you communicate with people that have um, opinions that are far distant than yours? Do you, you know, we've, we've, we struggle with this in this country today, and I, I don't think there's ever been a time where it was more important to, um, to teach these broad principles that bring us together rather than push us apart. And the more narrowly focused a degree is, the more difficult it is for us to talk to people who have another narrowly focused world. <laughs> mm -hmm. The T part of your description, Brad, of, um, is what connects us to everyone else. Not just, not just simply helps us have a broader capacity to be successful in the workforce. It's what connects us to everyone else. And and without that connection to everyone else, a democracy cannot survive. It's, it's dependent on us caring about each other. I think it's particularly important now when uh, we start seeing the atomization, right, of the country around tribes of ideas, mm -hmm. right, politically or uh, socially, um, when we're not talking to each other. Right. And we're, we're in our sort of information bubbles, right? We're believing only that information <laughs> that appeals to our biases, right? This is not what an educated person <laughs> does. An educated person, um, you know, is, is able to sort of sort out and have some, you know, the information literacy and skill set to try and sort out falsity and truth. Um, and to be an open, to have an open mind in a sense of being able to uh, speak to others and listen thoughtfully. I, I worry about 
the decline and degeneration of civil discourse. <laughs> I worry about, you know, um, uh, that, that in the age of, of alternative facts, um, whether we're going to have the, the proper informed convictions uh, and the intercultural literacy and the personal integrity um, that's, that's, that's kind of founded in good information, um, I, I think that's what a higher education is about too, is um, really fulfilling these ideals that you're talking about for the founding fathers and, and mothers um, about creating a healthy democracy. And a healthy democracy is, is dependent on good information yeah. and people having the you know, you know, a mindset and a critical uh, skill set to be able to sort out what is, um, you know, what's, what's true and what's false. So I think there are larger stakes at, uh, uh, involved uh, here. Yeah, and, and you, can, you can be a conservative or a liberal politically and still benefit greatly by... <laughs> this liberal education. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of our jobs. It's one of our leading responsibilities. Uh, the founders of Southern Utah University um, were largely farmers, ranchers, and miners who were competing to build a branch campus of the University of Utah in a very small rural community and that branch campus focus had nothing to do with farming, ranching, or mining. It, it had everything to do with training teachers because they knew how important education was in this red sand desert of Western America, that, that they had to have an educated people. And, not, and, and, and I think it's so interesting that a group of people whose uh, occupational skills required farming, ranching, mining, those kinds of things. But this school didn't offer, in its first year, didn't offer any classes in those subjects. <laughs> they were learning how to read, how to write, how to think. Um, they were learning about music. And they were learning about ideas. So, President... I want to just say that uh, working with you on this project has been delightful. And uh, one of the most delightful parts of it, aside from just getting to hang out with you, which is always fun, has been some of the interesting guests that we've had from our faculty. Um, we've highlighted a number of our um, award-winning faculty here at SUU. And one of the ones that, one of the podcasts that was voted highly by our listeners was featuring Dr. Britt Mace, who, as part of his job, records the sounds of nature, for lack of a better term. Yeah, he documents sound and uh, archives it, preserves it, uh, analyzes it, and then we, we have this uh, kind of like a library of sound. So they, they set up these... Um, these uh, pods, I think, for lack of a better term, that, that have sensitive microphones and uh, long-lasting batteries, and they're triggered by movement and, and, uh, or any sound that uh, can then get recorded. Um, and they'll walk this into the middle of a national park or a wilderness right, area like and set it down. Miles and miles off the beaten path yeah. and just set it down. And yeah. then, then leave and then come back. This particular story that, that we're going to highlight in, in uh, this little snippet that's coming up is sort of creepy, actually. <laughs> but uh, anyway, we'll, uh, this, is, this is our interview um, from Season 2, Podcast Number 21, with Dr. Britt Mace, The Sounds of Nature. So have you ever had a sound that just really was baffling? We do, uh, and we have it. We have one from the same site, the Waweep Hoodoos. Uh, let me provide you a little bit of context here. To get to the Waweep Hoodoos, it's about a five-mile hike uh, one way. And this sound that we recorded is from 2.30 in the morning. You can hear how sensitive our microphones are from hearing that last clip 
uh, we can pick up visitors or hikers from a, a ways away. And in this clip, there's a whisper, it sounds like. It's faint, uh, but it's in the middle of a, a jet clip. You'll hear a high altitude jet overhead. But there's also a whisper in here, and uh, we don't know what this is. And honestly, I don't know if we want to. <laughs> <laughs> I heard it. So you heard a it? jet, and then there was some. There's some. It sounds like there's there's blood. Some, it, that's exactly <laughs> what my research assistant Caesar, when he heard that, uh, his face turned white. Oh, yeah, uh, thought we had captured a ghost. Uh, no footsteps before or after. We scoured the recording looking for any other sign within that time period, and there's nothing else there so perhaps a puff of wind perhaps a ghost <laughs> well there's nothing more popular than ghosts today every town that i visit i can get a ghost tour not that i've done it but i noticed that there are ghost tours oh, yeah. everywhere yep uh we even have ghost tours at suu we so do. we in, should probably the building where we work the they building where we work ghost tours there's ghost stories, so we probably should have you put some recording instruments outside of Old Main. I'd be happy to. See if you could catch Virginia. See if we can catch Virginia. <laughs> Wailing some late night. I've heard there's other buildings on campus that might also have visitors. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that gives me chills every time I listen to that. As I said, it's kind of, it's a little bit creepy. Anyway, um, just a just a sample of some of the terrific faculty that we have here and what a what a joy it's been to interview some of them and we look forward in subsequent podcasts to introducing you our listeners to some of the other really talented um, and and gifted people that we work with yeah we're not a research institution by definition but we we still bring in at SUU about 15 million dollars in research grants and we have a lot of faculty involved uh, in in research project, adding to the knowledge base that we have, and and then helping students be part of those research projects so that they can do their own research. And um, it's it's uh, such a meaningful part of what we're doing. We mentioned earlier as we were talking about um, the interesting stories that students have to tell, and wouldn't it be fun if we could just have a interview every day with a different student. Right. The same thing's true with our faculty and so many of our staff, that they have such interesting lives and, and interesting contributions. So we have listeners, right? I mean, <laughs> we, we hope we do. We hope this is not just going out into the ether. And we, we actually put up on our website um, a, uh, an opportunity for listeners to vote for their favorite um, episodes and one of the things that we got from our listeners was this episode from season one episode number 13 about storytelling and the importance of it and we we had invited on to the show um, Mindy Benson who is our vice president for community relations am I saying that right yep okay well alumni and community she's, relations she's yes that's right and Mindy is a great storyteller and has a long institutional memory burned into her DNA about SUU. I think her grandparents attended here and and her father worked here and so forth. So she's she's been around this university literally for her entire life. And we talked a little bit about the story of the founding of Southern Utah University and why it's important that we tell stories, why it's important that that we not forget the struggle and the hardship and the sacrifice of the people that that put us on the map here. And not just important for us, but important for everyone to remember. Yeah, there's more to a story than just we like hearing stories. That's right. There's something there's something very meaningful about that. And and I, I remember when I 
whenever I ask my wife, I'm getting ready to give a talk, and if I say to her, do you have any suggestions? She'll always say, tell a story. I mean, I have a tendency to to move into analytical mode. Right, know? right. Um, and she keeps reminding me to move into story mode. And Because stories, people learn better that way. They relate better to it. Right. It, if if there's a connection to me as a person and, and I feel this emotional interest, I'm going to pay attention. Then give me the data. This is, this is Mindy Benson and Scott Wyatt talking about the founding of Southern Utah University. Um, let's bring this to today and to Southern Utah University. And every single organization has or should have stories like this. But I think that Southern Utah University perhaps has one of the best stories. I think we have the best founding story out there. Not that I've researched every institution, but we certainly have the grit and determination and everything that you need to make a story interesting. So you've been around um, Southern Utah University a lot longer than Steve or I. Um, since you, I was born. Since you were born, because mm-hmm. your dad worked here. My dad worked on campus. My grandma attended back in 1918. We'd, it's been carried on as part of the generations. They were even part of the founding families. When did the founding story um, of Southern Utah University become important? I believe that it's always been important to those who were there and those who lived it passed it on to their children. I don't know that it became a shared identity until we had Jerry Sherritt, a former president who was an alumnus, bring it back up again because it was his relatives again who had been part of the founding. And he brought it up in the 70s and 80s. I remember my grandparents talking about it in the 70s, but Jerry did his dissertation on it and spent a lot of time bringing it back to the public view. And I think since the 80s, it's really helped form who we are and shaped that identity. So where does our story begin? Back in 1897. Clear back then? Is that what you're talking about? (laughs) That's right. 1897. There is a contest because the University of Utah is going to create a branch campus somewhere in southern Utah, and all of these small communities become competitors to win the right to have this school. And uh, where does it go from there? You're a good storyteller. I was totally into (laughs) that right there. we We can go back and forth a little bit on this story. It's a great story, and and, uh, it has different focus. I think that the story is generally accurate, but for different people who tell it, they focus on different pieces of the story, depending on what moral they're trying to tell or what image they're trying to create. Um, But this is a community of 1,200 farmers, ranchers, and miners, and they've only been living here for a couple decades. Uh, Cedar City was settled what year, Mindy? Do you remember? Oh, I don't know that off the top of my head. We could Google it back yeah. to facts. They've only been here for a few decades, and it's still a frontier town. They're still focused on ranching and mining, farming, all those kinds of things. Survival. Survival. Yeah, they're still they in the doing survival it to mode. Survive. And when this contest comes up, there, the the condition that was given was that the town had to donate land and build on that land a school according to the exacting specifications of the state legislature. But the people in Cedar City didn't have money to build this, and they didn't have materials. This is still a frontier town, and all of the materials had been used to build a church building called Ward Hall. And so they made this assumption that, you know, maybe they'll just let us start school in Ward Hall, and then eventually we'll build a schoolhouse. Um, But on January 1st, um, 1898, 
the city, the town learns that if they don't build the school according to the requirements, by the time school starts that coming fall, eight months, that the school's going to be taken away from them and given to another town, that their hope that the, this church house would work uh, didn't. And, uh, and so they try to figure out what to do. And, and the, the difficulty is they don't have any materials, and they've got to start building this in the winter. And where do you get lumber? Where do you get bricks? Where do you get stones to build a foundation? In the dead of winter. They didn't have any of that. It wasn't easily attainable. They didn't have it in their backyards. And they were devastated, I believe. So they knew there was a um, sawmill up on the Mammoth, more than 10,000 feet above sea level, way up in the mountain, that had some lumber there. And they thought, well, maybe this is the way to get started. There wasn't a fraction of the lumber they needed at the sawmill. But, but that's something, you know. It's something that they can do. And so four days after learning about this problem, a group of 11 men and 22 horses, for the first time in their lives, head up the mountain in the winter. They had never been up there. So they were ill-prepared. They didn't know what was going to fall them, befall them. And uh, five days, that seems so long to me, five days into this journey and they still haven't accomplished their mission, and this snowstorm hits. And I, you know, all these stories that we have in Utah about the early settlers, they all seem to start the same way. There was a century <laughs> yes, big storm. <laughs> blizzard of the century. <laughs> and, and we don't know if this was the century of the blizzard, but century, the blizzard of the century, but, but that's the way the story goes, is that this was the storm of the century. That's part of what enhances it, if it wasn't the truth, and that's part of what enhances the story. But we know there was snow and it was a blizzard. Yeah, and it's the way Jerry Sherritt, former President Sherritt, tells the story. There's 11 horses. No, 22 22 horses. 22 horses. 11 11 men. men. 22 horses. And of all the horses, when they get up on the top of the mammoth, the the horses can't break through these massive snowdrifts that have been formed in this blizzard, except for one. And once one horse, uh, who they called Old Sorrel, an eight-year-old, 1,600-pound draft horse. Massive horse. Yeah. Is able to break through the drifts. And the way Jerry used to tell the story, it was, it was uh, the story focused on this horse and how amazing the horse was to be able to paw at the drifts and then sit down and pant and then paw some more and sit down and pant and just keep going. You, you um, grew up with horses, Mindy, and anybody that knows horses knows they don't like being in thick snow. No, they snow. don't. It's just, uh, it's hard for them. It's harder for horses probably in deep snow than it is for people. But they get through that. They find their way back to this uh, little cabin and spend the night and they've got to figure out what to do. And... Um, during the night, uh, four more people come up from town. So now there's 15, 15 in this little cabin. And they just, they're tired, they're hungry, they're cold, they're wet. They're in this blizzard. Frustrated. Frustrated. Yeah. I think that's probably where I would land is frustrated and not sure how we were going to get out of that. The whole town's depending on them. But, but um, as Jerry Sherritt tells the story, the, they barely escaped with their lives. Um, and um, I don't know if that's an overstatement or not, but, but for a bunch of settlers that uh, are unfamiliar with the mountains in the winter, had never been up there before, it, it's probably more accurate than sometimes we give it credit for. And you know what I love about it is each family who has passed it down has their own addition to it. They're not embellishing, but they'll talk about their great-grandfather did this, or their great-grandfather did this while this was happening, or they survived with one match, or old Sorrel, the only reason he was able to do that is he was lost as a young horse and had to climb out of a canyon to get himself free. And if you think about 
how all of that happened. And if that hadn't happened when he was a young horse, would he have known how to get out of the snow drift or would he have had the skills? It's just interesting how each family brings their own piece and how important this story is as a whole to the organization, but to each of those families who participated in it. Yeah, and it is amazing that that a horse was able to plow its way through, paw its way through these huge snowdrifts and uh, free a space that everybody could, could get through. Uh, I've spent a lot of time on mountains in the snow, and it's, it can be a little nervous. And, and um, when I go up there, I have Gore-Tex and snowshoes and all this kind of stuff. These, right. these people didn't have any of that. They don't have any of that, and they weren't prepared, as prepared as they should have been. And it's almost a miracle. In fact, it is a miracle that they were able to get through, and it was the power of that horse. But we can't forget the people. Yeah. So now we're, we're what, five, uh, f- four or five days before they're able to start up the mountain, and now we're about six days into the mountain journey. And uh, they're in this little uh, teeny cabin, uh, and it's morning, trying to decide what to do. They've escaped with their lives so far. Some think that the only thing to do is to just get out while they can because the storm's not over. They've been scared, understandably. And they have this uh, argument, and, and uh, a leader emerges. Um, and the leader is Neil Bladen. And Neil Bladen's descendants and uh, family members are still in town. and They are, and they're very proud of what he did. I've always heard Cornelius Bladen, and I've heard Neil Bladen, and I didn't know they were the same person. <laughs> it, it struck me when we were doing the documentary, oh, Neil Bladen was Cornelius Bladen, but Neil Bladen, Thomas Bladen, and the Bladen family is still here, and their roots run deep. Yeah. So that morning, they all get up. They're talking about what to do. Um, they know that this... There's, there's a few things they know, and one is is that many people in the community have mortgaged their homes to pay for the teachers' salaries. Yes, mortgaged their homes, ranches, sheep, everything they could to get this paid for. Uh, but some of them think that it's impossible, and so at the end of this discussion, they part ways. Five of them stay up on the mountain. The rest go down. And the five return back up to get the lumber. Uh, and that's kind of where um, the story starts to slide from these people into the rest of the community. That, that Neil Bladen leads this small group. They go up. They get the lumber. Again, it's an insignificant amount of lumber. This is one wagon load of lumber. But they haul it down into town, and when they arrive with as few boards as they had, it ignited a community. Jubilation. I think it was the motivation that everyone needed that this was possible and that they could do it and the sacrifice was great. Let's not let the sacrifice go to waste. Yeah, so now we find ourselves with women and men digging clay out of the cold earth to form and fire bricks to build it. That We've got people going up. Um, quarrying rocks for the foundation. Um, That one load of lumber wasn't nearly enough. So the whole community is pulling together, finding everything they can to fashion better sleds, uh, better clothes. The image in my mind, Mindy, is uh, this image of the entire town, 1,200 people total. So that would be a small number of families, actually. Um, with everybody having some commitment in it, leaving their farms, leaving their their minds, whatever they've got going to to pull together because they've got to fuse. They have to get it done. And Cedar City has always had that spirit. I think this exemplifies it more than any other story. Everyone pulled together and got it done. The women, the children, the men, everyone had something to do with it. I look at my great-grandfather, and he owned the tack shop in town and made blankets. He and his family made blankets for the horses. And there are story after story of what everyone in the community contributed. And everyone played an important part of that, and that's part of the culture that we pass on today. So 
when you arrived, I, I think you wanted to make sure that people knew the story of the old sorrel horse and um, that that y- you thought that was important enough that we actually put together a film about it. I think it was maybe the first thing that I worked on after I arrived, about a year after you were here, I arrived at SUU. And uh, uh, I, it was called Back Up the Mountain. Is that right? Right. Yeah. And uh, for any of our listeners that are interested in a copy of Back Up the Mountain, the, the story of the founding of Southern Utah University, you let us know if you'd like a copy of it, and we'll make sure that we send it out to you. I think you can also find it on the university's website. But if you're one of those old school people like I am that occasionally likes to pop a <laughs> DVD in, we'll be happy to send you a DVD. Yeah. It's uh, this this story about our founding is really important, and uh, we've you know you you look at um, how do we how do we see where we sit and and how do we plan for the future? Um, we have to look at our roots to know where our flowers bloom. So, President, this is a celebration of our fiftieth. Uh, episode and uh, we hope our listeners have enjoyed this look back at some of the greatest hits from from the last two years <laughs> yeah from the last two years uh, but uh, I should I should reiterate what a what a joy and what a pleasure it has been to work with you to put this together and um, we we do this because we want to let the world know about Southern Utah University and about the thought process of the senior administration here and some of the interesting and we hope innovative things that we are doing to try to make, um, well, to try to create solutions for higher education, just like the title says. But, but we also do it for ourselves because it helps us to think about those things. It, it, it forces us to sit down and uh, coalesce our thoughts and put them down in a meaningful way and then to reach out to others and see what others are doing in the world that uh, that maybe we had not thought of or or uh, could help us to do things better. So we we hope that for you, our listeners, that this has been as meaningful as it has been for us because it's quite meaningful for us. Right, and it's uh, I we continue to learn as we explore these ideas and and go back through I, things that we've done in the past and yeah. Um, just a, it's just so much uh, it, it's just so fun to be involved in so many great ideas so many interesting people it is and to be able to talk about them you've been listening to solutions for higher education a podcast featuring scott l wyatt the president of southern utah university in cedar city utah we thank you for listening our devoted listeners and we'll be back again with another run of brand new podcasts very soon thanks for listening bye-bye Thanks for listening to Solutions for Higher Education. To subscribe to this podcast, please visit www.suu.edu forward slash President's Podcast, where you will find both the audio and a written transcript of today's podcast. The original music for this podcast was composed by Jack Barton, a master's degree student in music technology at SUU. For more information about Southern Utah University, please visit www.suu.edu.